Well, good morning. And welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. If you are a guest today, you are among friends. And uh, let's make room as folks come in from the lobby. Come on down to the front. There's a lot of high dollar seats open. And we're going to have a great time today. We have lunch afterwards. We hope you'll stay for that. Uh, but this morning is all about what God is doing around the world through Emmanuel Baptist Church. Let's stand together and let's lift up our hearts and our voices and worship the Lord Jesus. Hey, we're going to continue worshiping. Uh, the chorus that we've been learning for the last few weeks, our missions theme, May the Peoples Praise You. Sing this out with us nice and loud. You have called us out of darkest night. It's our holy this morning.
for the message of the cross a world that changes daily yet your truth remains the same here we are lord send us we will go in jesus name My name is Derek Williams, one of the assistant pastors here at Emmanuel. We are so glad you're here this morning. I want to ask everyone, if they would, to take out the connection card found in their bulletin. I want to ask if you're a member or regular tender here today, share a prayer request with us. Let us know how we can be praying for you. If you're a first-time guest or a returning guest, we are really glad you're here. Thank you so much for being here this morning. We hope that will be an encouragement to you. We want to ask you, just let us know how you heard about Emmanuel. In the back of the card there, you can mark that, and in just a few moments, you can all place those in the offering plate. At the end of the service, if you're a first-time guest, we have a gift for you. If you'll stop by the Next Step tables in the back of the room on your way out, just let them know. We want to put a gift in your hand that includes a book that our pastor wrote called Done, What Most Religions Don't Tell you about the Bible. We think it's a really helpful read. We want to give that to you as a gift to say thanks for being here today. Stop by and pick one of those up. At this time, we want to ask everyone to stand as the music plays. Say hi to someone around you.
you find your seat this morning. Guests, we're so thankful that you're here with us today. Don't forget to stop by one of our next step tables on your way out this morning. That's right at the back of the worship center. Let's continue to worship this morning and sing about how great, how truly great our God is this morning. Sing with us. The splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his that is singing so far this morning. We're going to continue to worship with one more song and give him praise and glory. What a beautiful name it is. Sing this with us. You were the word at the beginning. One with God the Lord most high. You're hidden Beautiful name it is, the 
what I'd like to do right now. I'd like to just pause. And um, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, we brought you here, we invited you so that you could meet the most awesome, wonderful person you've ever met. We pray that today you would trust him as Savior. We had a, a starting point class a little while ago. If you're new, we hope you'll join us for a starting point. My wife and I host that with another couple, and we, we had such a great time today. But just going around the room hearing, uh, oh, this person trusted Christ a few weeks ago. This person trusted Christ in April. This person trusted Christ a year ago. And nearly almost everybody in the room trusted Christ at Emmanuel in the last year or so. And, uh, and, and he, is a, he is a wonderful Savior. I, I want to pause right now. I want to ask the, the team to sing through the first verse in the chorus. And I'd like to invite you either to the altar or to your seat, but just to pause right now, quiet before the Lord Jesus, and ask, number one, put your burden in his hands, whatever you came in here carrying. Number two, ask him uh, to speak to your heart today from his word, and just let him know you wanna listen to him. Not necessarily me, but to him as we open his word. He will teach us, and he'll do the work in us that he wants to do if we let him. So let's take about the next 60 seconds, maybe two minutes, and let's just pause quietly, hear the first verse and chorus of this song, go through the chorus twice, and we'll sing together on the, on the last chorus. But in that first verse and chorus, just find a pa place to pray, okay? And, uh, and if, you, if you don't know Jesus as Savior, then ask him to show himself to you. Just say, hey, if you're there, Jesus, I'm, I'm open, I'm open to hearing more about you. If you know him, worship him, okay? You were
family as you find your seat. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ is my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. All right, be seated, the rest of you, and thank you for taking that moment, team. Thank you for singing. What a great song. I want to ask uh, ushers to come and prepare for the offering at this time. Say, Pastor, why are you crying? I have no earthly idea. Um, I'm not dying of cancer or, uh, you know, I'm not dealing with any particular discouragement. I just uh, love Jesus and I hope you do too. And, um, and I hope that you love him more because you were here today. I want you to find very, very briefly in your bulletin two things. Um, there's a postcard that says Emmanuel Global. And there is a, a commitment card, a giving card that it says on one side, missions investment card. Won't take a lot of time, uh, but uh, in, in our message today, we'll be referencing the, the giving card. And this is a, a, a day, a, a one of few Sundays a year that we actually pause as a church family to talk for a few moments about money. If you're a guest today, I do apologize. It's not our goal. We're not, we don't really, we're not after your money. Uh, before God asks you to give him anything, he wants to give you everything. It's all about what he's given you to begin with. But for those of us that are part of the vision of our church and the mission of our church, um, it's important that a few times a year we pause and look at the Bible, examine what the Bible says about our generosity, and that's a part of today. And I'm asking you that are part of Emmanuel to take this card and, and, and to think about it. Many of you will respond today, others uh, maybe next week or the week after. But the next couple of weeks we'll receive these as well. But it's, it's, it, it's perforated and uh, it, part of it is for your own planning, for you to kind of do your own calculation. But then the part on the left says missions investment card. If you are increasing your missions giving, if you are starting to give to missions and you haven't previously, or if you're going to take the tithe challenge, and we, we encourage this a couple times a year, there are those in the room that, that you don't give on a regular basis. I don't know who you are. I never study who gives what at Emmanuel. So don't ever worry about me and what I think of you in those, respect, in, in those terms. But if you haven't yet learned to give God the first fruit of what he gives to you, then our challenge to you today is not so much that you begin giving to missions as much that you would begin giving faithfully and systematically to your church. And we call that tithing, just a, a, a word for systematic giving. And the word means 10%, and that's a good starting point. It's an Old Testament principle of, of a starting point of how to, how to bless God. And here's the premise, and I don't have time to, to go as far into it as I'd like to, but the premise is this. God says, I'm gonna give you 100%. I want you to give me back a starting point of 10%, and maybe more as he gives you margin and as he blesses you. But, but God, God said, well, I could give you less and just not ask for anything back. But that doesn't give, give us a good relationship. I, he wants a relationship of faith and trust. He wants you to see that he can make your 90% or 85 or 80 or whatever percentage you, he can make what you have left go farther than if you kept it all and didn't give him any. That's how it works, okay? And it's a, it is a gift to you to be able to give to God. It's a gift for me to be able to give to God. I, he doesn't need my money, but I need to honor him and I need to have a way to say thank you to him and to express love, and so that's how he says we can express our love to him, by giving to his work of the gospel through our church. If you are not a, a tither, if you're not someone that stepped in, into that by faith, here's my dare for you, I dare you, okay? Um, 90 days, just decide for 90 days, you're gonna give God the first 10% of everything he gives to you. After 90 days, if God hasn't met your needs, Come to me and we will reimburse you all of your 90 days worth of tithe. Every penny, if he hasn't met your needs, we'll reimburse it. I said to the staff one time I was gonna do that and they said, well, pastor, what are you gonna do? I said, what, you guys don't believe God's gonna meet their needs? <laughs> Sounds like the church last week in Acts chapter 12, praying for Peter's release and you know, Peter gets released, they didn't expect it. You know. My point is, I've, I've said that for, I don't know, five years or so. I've never had one person come back and say, I need all my tithe back. And I'm serious, okay? I'm legitimate. I'm legitimately saying, if God doesn't meet your needs, if he doesn't prove himself to you in 90 days, come back and 
I will, I will instruct our financial accounting firm in Atlanta to cut you a check and reimburse whatever you've given. I am not worried, okay? I'm not worried. God's going to meet your needs. But if you decide you're going to do that today or in the next week or so, just check that box and drop it in the offering plate because I'm going to pray. You don't put your name on this, by the way. This is anonymous. But I'm going to pray specifically for those families that take that step of faith. You will never regret putting God's kingdom first. And so this is, you'll hear more a little bit about our mission focus in the message today. But that's what that card is for. The second card is for everybody and the kids and everybody else. I mean, everybody, okay? This is a card to our missionaries. And your card has a name on it. My card is to Roger Pero in Ireland. We want you to write a quick word of encouragement. Not while I'm preaching, but just, hi, praying for you. Thank you for serving Jesus. You can write a verse. You can write a prayer. Uh, you don't have to know these people. It doesn't matter. Just write them a word of encouragement. We will bundle these up, collect them all, send them to all of our missionaries. We want all of our missionaries to get 50 to 100 cards from our church family. It'll take you less than 60 seconds if you do what I'm saying. Just jot it very quickly, and you can drop these off on your way out the door uh, as you leave today or as you leave the lunch, okay? These cards we want to receive at the end of the service, those of you that are ready to, to turn them in, and other, others of you that want to think about it and do some planning, you can, you can turn that in over the next couple of weeks, okay? Um, let me see, what else am I supposed to say? Uh, I want to make sure I don't miss anything uh, before we receive, pray, and receive our offering. Actually, I'm going to miss something if I didn't look at this. I'm really glad to introduce to you David McCrum. Brother McCrum, where are you? Uh, if you'll come up this way and pray for us in just a moment for our offering. Uh, this man is a new friend to me, but he has been really his entire life uh, from birth on the mission field in South Africa. And he has recently uh, taken the leadership of a church that his father planted. And we won't have the time today to hear as much of his work as I would like to. Uh, but he's about to ordain several national pastors in South Africa, and uh, they're engaged in church planting work. And uh, this is a work that we want to get on board with, pending the commitments that we make. If we see our missions fund grow, we want to get into South Africa uh, through Emmanuel Global and through this man's work. And so, uh, Brother Crum, thank you for being with us today and for sharing in this time. And then before you pray, I just want to take a minute to welcome my dad. Dad, where are you? Right here on the third row, uh, my dad, Lance Schmidt, the original Lance Schmidt. And, uh, and I, I'm so glad he could be here today. He's going on this trip with us to Israel. And uh, thank, thank the Lord for a dad who loves Jesus and taught, showed me how to love Jesus. And uh, I'm so glad you could be here today, Dad, to, uh, to celebrate with us. So, uh, Brother McCrum, come lead us in prayer. Ask God to bless our service. Take, take a minute and tell us about your work and then pray that God will bless our offering, okay? Thank you, Pastor. It's good to be here this morning, and I've been really looking forward to this meeting. My wife and I have been married 15 years just this month in South Africa, 14 of those. And though I grew up in South Africa, when God called us, I was scared to death. Uh, not of Africa, but just scared what will happen to me. And we were traveling and trying to start raising support, and a lady in a church just challenged me. She said, how are you going to do this? I said, ma'am, I don't know. <laughs> I've never done this before. And do you know when you follow God, you don't have to have done it before. And we find throughout the scriptures when men and women just said, okay, God, I will trust you. I will go. I will be. I will do. As the widow uh, in the Old Testament, she just brought her pots. And do you know what? As many pots as she brought, God filled them. And uh, I would just love to be another pot. And we're glad to be in South Africa. He has done far more than we ever thought or dreamed. Uh, our church plant commissioned its first church planter. So our church is doing the same things that you are doing. And our church plant in South Africa also supports South African missionaries that then go further. And Pastor Stambisa Mahlangu is on staff with us for four years, and now he has started Spring Valley Baptist Church. And Lord willing, in February, we will be ordaining Clive and Coraline to full-time ministry and some others. Please pray for us, and uh, thank you so much for having us here. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us and your provision. Father, we ask that you would use our tithes, our offerings, our giving for the furtherance of the gospel. May men and women... Boys and girls, today, 
trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The only thing I want in life is to be known for loving Christ, to build his church, to love his bride, and make his name known far and wide. For this call. Thank you, ladies. That was beautiful. I want you to take your Bible with me and turn to uh, Acts chapter 13. And if you are new with us, we're in a series entitled Activate. We're discovering how a gospel identity 
becomes a tool in God's hands to activate us for gospel momentum. And today is really kind of a critical moment in that process of activation uh, as we see it unfold in the book of Acts. We're just going verse by verse, section by section, through Luke's account of the earliest followers of Jesus. So we spent a couple years in Luke studying the life of Christ, and now we're seeing what Jesus is doing through his early followers, the first century church, and we are uh, bringing and lifting off applications for us today. So Acts chapter 13, today we're looking at verses 1 through 12, and church today is a workshop, and, and I need you to have the context of this in the next few moments. It's a workshop, and what do I mean by that? Well, Sometimes we come to church for the, for the single purpose or reason of I need help. I want to be helped. I want to be encouraged. I want to be lifted. And I pray you are and I pray you have been. But today I want you to reverse the question. And it, I don't think that's a bad question. I don't think there's even a dichotomy between these two questions. I just want today to focus on how can I be a help? How can I make a difference? And not just me or you individually. But how can we, and it really isn't either or, it's both and. And we're going to see that today in the church at Antioch. And I think what happens to my voice at this time of year is I, I sing it out down there, and then I get up here and I sound sick, okay? So I'm not sick, but I can already feel my voice is going, okay, I don't have much left. I guess I get carried away a little bit in the singing, but that's okay. I enjoyed it. How about you? Okay. So... Today, uh, we want to ask, how can we make a difference? How does this work? And here's my key statement that we're going to build on for the next uh, few moments. As we grow in health, God grows our reach. As we grow in health as a church and as individual Christians coming together in the body, and as we mature as Christians, God grows our reach. He he enlarges our hearts to want to make a difference. He enlarges our resources to be able to make a difference. And he gives us the ability to reach out in faith, in spite of opposition, in spite of, of hardships that we're bearing in life. And as Emmanuel grows deeper in gospel understanding and in gospel mission and generosity, as our focus clarifies and crystallizes as our purpose uh, strengthens and galvanizes as we gather around that purpose, as he develops a passion in us to help other people come to meet Jesus, not just here, but in churches locally, in churches regionally, as I say on the sign, foreign, national, local, and through media. As he does this work, he will not only increase our maturity and depth as a church, but he will expand our reach as a church and give us the ability to help more people in more places, to send more people to more places. This is what he does. And time, for the sake of time today, and we want to focus on the scripture, time does not permit me, but I could take the remainder of my time and just begin to show you the tip of the iceberg of the ways God's using your faithfulness and your story and your generosity to impact and to touch lives. I believe there's a man here today, and I haven't met him yet, and I hope to meet him, but I believe he's here today. He got on our website, we talk about media, and he watched the messages about the gospel and he trusted Christ as Savior. And he said to Pastor Derek, I'll be there Sunday. And I hope he's here, and welcome, and congratulations, sir, if you're here. And I could go on and on and on and tell you the stories, and you would weep, and you would rejoice, and you would celebrate, but this is what God does. He grows us stronger, but not just for ourselves. Okay, we sang it at the very first part of the service. All your blessing flows or comes that we may praise, we may publish. We are blessed for a purpose. God's blessings are given to us, yes, to enjoy, yes, to say thank you, but more than any of that, to be a blessing, to turn around as a church and say, who can we serve? Who can we send? Who can we help? Who can we help to get the gospel to? Now, here's where we are in the scripture, in the context. I want to give you a very quick synopsis of this part of the book of Acts. Chapter 9, we read about a man named Saul who became a Christian. He was a skeptic. He was a killer of Christians. He was no, public enemy number one of Christianity on the planet, and he became a follower of Jesus. But the Christians in Jerusalem did not want him. 
They were afraid of him. They were annoyed by him. He was obnoxious. He was argumentative. And so he only spent two weeks in Jerusalem, and they said, go back to Tarsus. And so Saul goes back to Tarsus. Well, in the process of that, in the next chapter, chapter 10, God begins to deal with Peter. Peter is the apostle uh, near Jerusalem. He's staying in Joppa. And he has a vision. And he has a vision of this, this sheet full of animals, and God says, hey, Peter, eat. Eat these animals. Well, the dietary laws wouldn't have permitted him to, so he says in the vision, no, Lord, I can't eat. And God says, don't, don't call unclean or un- inedible what I call edible. And in that In that vision, three times, God basically says to Peter, I want everybody. I want the gospel to go to the whole world, not just the Jews, but to Gentiles. And unless you're Jewish, okay, if you're Jewish, you're the exception today, right now, everybody else is a Gentile, okay? So there's, according to this story, there's really two people groups in Peter's mind, Jews and Gentiles. Um, And he would have thought, God wants to save the Jews, but not the Gentiles. God says, no, I want to save Jews and Gentiles. I want to save everybody. While he's understanding this vision, some guys knock on his door. Uh, They're from a town called Caesarea, and they're from a guy named Cornelius, who happens to be a Roman Gentile soldier, and he's wanting to be saved. He's wanting to know the gospel. And these guys come, and the Spirit of God says, Peter, go, go to Caesarea and share the gospel with Cornelius. So chapter 10 is all about the story of the gospel starting to go to the Gentiles. Chapter 11 of Acts, the Jews are not happy. So Peter has to go back to Jerusalem. They're upset. They're cantankerous. They're criticizing him for giving the gospel to Gentiles. He explains what's going on. They finally give in. They rejoice. They say, okay, God must want to save the Gentiles. And that moves us into chapter, by the way, at the end of that chapter, um, at the end of that chapter, there is prediction of a famine in Jerusalem. And, uh, and this is all happening at the same time uh, at a church in Antioch, I should have said. Um, which is a little further north. This church at Antioch has, has exploded and, and Barnabas is, is up there teaching and he's got Saul. He went and got Saul, brought him back to teach the Bible. And for one year, they've taught the Bible at a new church in Antioch and they've sent an offering to Jerusalem. Last week, we did chapter 12. Chapter 12, Paul and Barnabas leave their church in Antioch. They take an offering to Jerusalem, which is kind of cool. Paul's taking money to people that don't even like him and he's gonna bless them. Well, while they're there, everything comes undone. And we studied about the chaos last week. Herod kills one of the three most prominent leaders of the church, James. He imprisons Peter, but it happens to be Passover week, so he can't put him to death, so he throws him in jail. And he's waiting to put him to death publicly. Herod is the king and he hates the church and the Jews now hate the church. They want the church gone out of Jerusalem. Church in Antioch, just north, is thriving. Church in Jerusalem is now suffering. Paul and Saul and Saul, Paul, they're interchangeable ter- names. Paul and Barnabas are there delivering an offering when all this happens. Peter's in jail. The church is fervently praying for him. And you remember that the angel sets him free in the middle of the night. Peter's a little groggy, wakes up in the middle of a street in Jerusalem, realizes it wasn't his imagination and he wasn't dreaming. He's really been set free. He goes to the house where the people are praying. They don't believe it's him. They, they finally start to celebrate. He quiets them. He says, I got to go into hiding. And he leaves. And at the end of chapter 12, in fact, you can look at it with me. Acts, let me find my place. Acts 12, the very last verse says that Barnabas and Saul uh, went, went, uh, went back to Jerusalem. They returned from Jerusalem, I should say, when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them a, a young man named John, whose surname is Mark. And you'll Find out later in the, in, the, in the study, he's the author of the Gospel of Mark later down the road. But right now he's just a young man and he's Barnabas' cousin. So here's where we pick up. You still with me? I know this is boring. I know this is like, you know, it's like, okay, pastor, get to it. So here's where we pick up chapter 13. Church at Antioch is exploding. They've, they've been generous. They've been sending uh, uh, Saul and Barnabas. They're back now. So let's pick it up in verse 1. And let's discover what God's going to do in Antioch because the Antioch church is a model church. Antioch church is a model to us of what God does in churches that get serious together about doing the work of the gospel, okay? And so today, Jesus builds a healthy church, letting the gospel shape our church and our mission. First, three steps on the journey, okay? First step, number one, Jesus guides his church. 
First thing we're going to see early in the life of this church is that they are guided by God-called, gospel-shaped leaders. And this is beautiful. Let's take a moment to study it. Acts 13, verses 1 through 3. Now there were in the church, in fact, let's read these verses out loud together, okay? Ready, go. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. A couple of things real quick, I wanna bounce on this and move off. Gospel-shaped leadership, what does it look like? Because it's a model, and we could spend our entire time in verses one through three. It's a beautiful model of what gospel-shaped leadership in a local church should look like. First, these men served and blessed and built up others. This is what they were giving their lives to. And we just read their names. Uh, Barnabas, who grew up in Cyprus, sort of a Greek Jew. Simeon and Lucius, both men from Africa. Maenaean, a Roman who grew up in a wealthy, educated environment with Herod, who was king, okay? Um, so these men have, have been, been placed providentially together by God at the church of Antioch, and they're serving together for the blessing and building up of the people. Secondly, they focused on the ministry of the word and prayer. This is what they gave themselves to. Uh, they were teachers and prophets. That's just simply to say they, they opened the word of God and taught the church. That's what they did. It's how the church functioned. And they were fasting. They were doing the work of, of God and serving people. It was their priority. Third quality, they were ministering to the Lord. And there's a lot there that I don't have time to unpack, but one of the priorities of these, this group of men was, how does God want this done? We're serving God. We're not just serving people, and we're certainly not trying to make everybody happy. In other words, the church was functioning as a theocracy under God's rule. They were servants of God first and people second. It wasn't strictly a democracy, like we want the church to be whatever we want it to be. These were people both leaders and believers in the church that were saying, we want our church to be shaped by Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. Are you with me, church? You want Jesus to shape Emmanuel? Absolutely, okay? So these men, they made ministering to the Lord their priority. It was accountable. Uh, it, it was protecting them from compromise of giving in to factions or preferences within the church body. They were ministering to the Lord. Fourth quality, they were co cooperating with multiplicity and with unity, and you might also add the word diversity. These were very different men, ethnically, uh, economically, uh, sociologically. They just grew up in different environments. They had very little in common, but they came together because they had the same Savior. They came together because they had the same gospel purpose, the same gospel mission. It didn't matter if they liked the same sports team. It didn't matter if their skin was the same color or they happened to speak the same native language or share the same traditions. These were Jews mixing with Greeks, Jews mixing with Africans, Africans mixing with Romans. It was a mixture and a beautiful, wonderful ethnic, cultural diversity coming together with a higher call. Amen? That's what a church ought to be. And that's, I love that that's what Emmanuel is. I love that. Next, we, we read that these men were listening to and following the Holy Spirit of God. You see what God's about to do? He's about to say, give me your two best leaders. Say goodbye to them and send them away. That's a little bit scary. It would scare me if I was one of these men. It would scare me if I was a member of the church. But these were men that were really letting God's spirit lead and direct, and they were willing to be sacrificial and obedient. Next quality I wrote down is they were engaged together in gospel sending. So we've talked for three weeks now about men were sending, helping to send to upstate New York to plant churches. We'll meet in a few weeks a man that we're helping to send to Phoenix, Arizona to plant a church. We uh, have, have heard from men in um, 
El Salvador and in Mexico City and I mean all, we'll hear from London in a few weeks. I mean, we're doing everything that we can where we are right now with the resources God's given us to be involved in gospel sending. And then finally, they, and, I, and this isn't listed on the list, but they gave their best. They gave their best leaders. They were totally committed to the call of the gospel even over their immediate comfort. And I just have to pause here, church, before we go on and, and just say as a sidebar, I thank God for the great team he's brought us at Emmanuel Baptist Church. This is not, a, a, this is not one guy leading this. This is not me, Superman, super pastor. This is weak Pastor Kerry, uh, insufficient Pastor Kerry. I share sometimes with you my insecurities, my struggles sometimes with discouragement, but I, hear, I, want, you to, I want to offset that. There's another side to that coin. I have no doubt of my call. I have total confidence in Jesus Christ. I love what I get to do. Thank you for letting me teach the Bible and lead and love our church. I'm imperfect and I'm insufficient, but if you'll keep me, I'll stay, okay? I love it, okay? So I didn't, I wasn't trying to get a clap, but I don't want you to, when I try to share my discouragement, I'm trying to say I'm like you, okay? I wrestle with my own issues, okay? Um, I'm not trying to say be worried because I'm unstable. I'm not, maybe I am a little unstable. I don't know. You have to talk to Dana, okay? Uh, but I have great confidence in Christ. I have great confidence that I see him at work in our church and through our church. I rejoice in it. I have strong assurance that I am living in obedience to his call, and that gives me assurance. But let me tell you what I'm surrounded with, some great men, Amen. truly great men. I would not quantify myself as a great man. When I sit in the room with our staff or our deacons and finance leaders, I, I'm not the smartest man in the room. Uh, I'm just the guy you guys voted to lead the meetings. But those men are great men. And I'm telling you, they're not, they're not power trippy. They're not cronies. They're not, you know, they're not trying to make it for themselves or their families. They're not trying to, you know, do what they want. There's not a faction to them. There is, a, there is what we read in Acts 13. There is a spirit-led wholeness of heart and humility. First thing we do in our meetings, we get together. If we can kneel, some that can't kneel because they're a little older, but we get on our face before God and we say, God, give us wisdom. We love your church. This is your church. We want to serve these people. We want to steward their gifts. We want to invest for eternity. We, we care about you, and we care about being good stewards for, for Jesus Christ and for what you give. And I want to preface the generosity part of the message by saying there are some godly men looking at how we invest your gifts. Here and in Atlanta, there's two big teams of people. I'm just one of about 20 people that look at the finances of our church. And I have great confidence that the gift I gave this week is gonna be steward, stewarded well, and I have the same confidence for you. We have a great team of godly, humble leaders. And church, thank God for them. And may God raise up more. I wanna just go to step two in the outline. So Jesus guides his church. And boy, has he guided Emmanuel like he did Antioch. But I want you to see secondly in the narrative that Jesus makes his church generous. The pastor doesn't make the church generous. I can't tell you how many times in my 42 years of Christian living I've been yelled at to give cheerfully as though a grumpy face is gonna make me a happy giver. A screaming voice into my head screaming at me, God loves a cheerful giver, doesn't make me cheerful. How about you? I don't understand the irrationality of that communication style, okay? Jesus can make you a cheerful giver, okay? When you stand in service and saying, what a powerful name it is, there's something in your heart that says, how do I say thank you to this wonderful Savior? How do I bless him? How do I help other people to be glad like this? When we sing a song like, let the peoples praise you, what are we singing? We are saying, God, do in other churches what you're doing here. Let somebody in South Africa have my kind of joy. You remember the joy that the day you got saved? 
When you realize your sins were forgiven and you, you, Jesus hung on a cross in your place and resurrected for you to save you and, and your record was clean with God and your heart was reconciled to God and the Spirit of God came into your life and called you his and birthed you again and adopted you into his family and stamped you with his seal of his Holy Spirit and calls you his eternal child and you're gonna live in heaven forever and ever and the world worst, the worst that this life ever gets is you die and then eternity in heaven starts again and all and never, never will you be threatened with death or suffering. I mean, remember the moment you, these realization hit you, I'm forgiven, I'm loved, I'm saved, I'm never gonna be separated from God, I'm going to heaven and nothing can take it away. Do you remember that moment? When we sing let the peoples praise you, what we're singing is God take that joy to other people. Take that joy to other cities with other church planners and other missionaries. And if you can use my dollar, my $10, my $100, if you can use my gift to send it around, then God, do it. Let the peoples praise you. And I can tell you right now, there's a church in South Africa that we want to help support. And I can tell you on a Sunday morning, they are praising the same Savior we praise. And I can tell you there's a church in Mexico City with Josue Ortiz right now this morning in an hour or so. And man, Dave, they will be praising their hearts out. Josue does the same thing. He sings his voice out. And then, he, and then he, it's all raspy the rest of the day. Those Mexi that Mexican church praises God like Emmanuel does. Jesus does this work in you. He, he makes you generous. I don't have to work to make you generous. Well, how, what did he do to the church at Antioch? Well, just very quickly, go back to chapter 11 just for a second. Hold your place. Go back to chapter 11. And look at verses 29 and 30. We saw it a few weeks ago, but let's review. And by the way, remember, this was a young church. This offering happened in their first year of life. So no member of this church, with the exception of Barnabas and Saul, no member of this church has been saved more than a year. These are Gentiles that have just come to Christ. You say, well, you gotta be saved a long time, and you gotta wait, you gotta grow into giving. And yes, you gotta grow into giving, but the New Testament pattern is, the New Testament church became generous immediately. Like the minute they trusted Christ, they realized, wait a minute, I've got God. I don't have to worry about money anymore because God's gonna take care of me. And that means I can look at my money as a tool instead of my savior, instead of money as my savior. Money becomes a resource I can leverage for God's purposes and for God's agenda. So. The preceding verses say that there's a prophet that comes to Antioch saying there's going to be a famine and the Jerusalem Christians are going to have a hard time. And look at verse 29. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability. Now remember, church, this is the reason you don't have to freak out about giving. Because God never expects you to give what he doesn't give you. It's to your ability, okay? So according to his ability, determine. There's the purpose, the focus. They're, they're, they're all in. Every man, every part of the church said, we're all into this. And they determined to send relief unto the brethren. And that is an offering. And by the way, that's an offering in addition to their regular operational offering. So this church has already, a chapter ago, shown us a, a stellar example of growing as a healthy church and seeing a need that you can help to meet, help to reach, and that you can reach out and give to. And I'll tell you two that we're gonna be a part of very soon. And I'll tell you how God's already begun to, met, to meet them, and I haven't even really barely mentioned them. Josue in Mexico City is preparing to, to, to purchase and, or renovate an outdoor space that with a covering that would become his auditorium. He needs $15,000. I said, Josue, I know that's not gonna be a problem with your supporting churches, and I know Emmanuel will be a big part of it. I don't know what big part of it, if all or part. I got another uh, need that came to me. We had Ken Baker here a, a few weeks ago. He, he pastors a church plant in the Bronx, right downtown the Bronx. They have the opportunity to build, I'm mean not build, to buy a building. And Ken needs about $50,000 more of about 150 dollars that, that they've raised. He needs a, a one final chunk in the next six months. And I told Ken when he was here, Ken, I don't know if it'll be five, a thousand, or five, or ten, but you can count on us to be a part of that building purchase with you. Okay, so last night I get an email. And I don't know how God's gonna do it. Last night I get an email from a man in our church, and God led him here over the last year, and he said, Pastor, I had access to an account that we closed 
It had $12,000 in it, and you can expect that to be in the offering for missions tomorrow. I said, Dana, read this. You know, I, I was just so excited. Wow, God, you're way ahead of me. Here's my point. I didn't tell, I didn't know he had that account. I didn't tell him to close that account. I didn't tell him to give it to missions. But Jesus does that. Jesus does that work. You say, well, I don't have 12,000. If he didn't give you 12,000 and doesn't tell you to give it, you don't have to worry about it. Why? Because the gospel keeps us from being comparative. So if God says you give a dollar and he gives 12 and somebody else gives 100,000 and this guy gives 1,000 and this guy gives 100, it doesn't matter. Jesus does that work. All you have to do is listen to him and obey. All you have to do is trust him with what he's put into your hands. But it gets better than that. I want you to see uh, chapter 13, verse three. When they, these are the leaders of the church, had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them. Now this is a beautiful picture, church. And by the way, this is, this is not necessarily an ordination, but this is a beautiful picture of togetherness. It's a beautiful picture of engagement and we are with you, we are for you. And I wanna paint it for you. Jonathan, can I borrow you? Okay, come on up here. And then let me have uh, three or four of our pastoral staff or deacons that are around. Just jump up wherever you are and come up here real quick. Or, uh, or, or just a, a friendly man, okay? Come over, come up here. Stand down here. So here we go. And I need one more young guy. Let's see. What's his name? Jared? Is it Jared? William. William, come up here, William. Okay. So you be Paul. Um, you be Barnabas. Come over here. So they prayed and they fasted. And then come over here, guys. You know what they did? The leaders of the church, and maybe the church together, they gather around them, they, they put their hands on them. Go ahead and put your hands on them. You have to have the suit cleaned, okay, Jonathan? Okay. <laughs> they put their hands on them, and they prayed. They prayed. You know what they were saying when they put their hands on them? We go with you. Our hearts are with you. Our, our finances are with you. We're, we, we share in the work. We are on your team. We're praying for you. We love you. You're, 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 you're a part of us. Okay, you guys can be seated. So they gave their, here it is, okay? They're generous, and I think I've got a list. If you can put that up, fellas. This church was generous, generous with their financial resources. They were generous, not that list. Okay, they're generous with their financial resources. They're generous with their leadership and their influence. They're sending those, those people. Maybe I didn't create that list. Did we take it out? I'm sorry, my mind's all over the place. They're generous with their prayer and their support and their encouragement, and they're generous with their steadfastness. In other words, this church, here it is, becomes a home base for Paul and Silas and for teams of people now for decades that are gonna go out throughout Asia Minor and all across to Rome and beyond Rome. This church becomes the, the, um, the word I'm looking for, the earthquake, the epicenter. It becomes the epicenter of gospel expansion. Why did they become an epicenter? Because they were unified in gospel ministry and because Jesus expanded their heart in generosity. They wanted to help get the gospel around the world and so they were willing to send these men. So Paul and Silas quickly, I'm mean not Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, they go forth, verse four, by the Holy Ghost, they departed to Seleucia, that's a port city, put up the map if you would, guys, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Cyprus is a gigantic island in the Mediterranean Sea. And verse five, when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue. Salamis is a city on Cyprus. They go to the synagogues and they start to preach to the Jews and they had John Mark as their minister. So they had this young man helping them, okay? So here's some takeaways and I have to hurry. Antioch was a generous church, therefore it was a greatly used church. God blesses and God uses generous people, generous churches and he provides for both. He provides for both. So I say it again, church, as we grow in health, God will grow our reach. And a healthy church family, hear this, is always asking, not simply what's best for me, not simply what's best for us locally, a healthy church is always collectively asking what is best for the most people in the most places. Now can you say that with me? I'm gonna say it again, I don't have a slide for it. 
A healthy church is always asking, and here's the question, what is best for the most people in the most places? Say that question with me. What is best for the most people in the most places? I dream for the day when we can have two morning services, and I can preach this message twice. It'll always be better the second time. Why do I dream for that day? Because I'd rather to preach the gospel to twice as many people than just have just us. Do you understand that? And I would much rather use our space twice. Let me go further. I would much rather help to establish 10 healthy churches in the Hartford area than ever have a church of multiple thousands of people. I'm not opposed to a church of thousands of people. Jerusalem had thousands of people. I'm simply saying, I would rather ask what's best for the most people in the most places than what's best for us or what's best for me, okay? And a long time ago, and I'm not trying to, to pat myself on the back, if I was asking what's best for me, um, we would have done things significantly different, okay? We need to be asking this question, what's best for the gospel? Do you hear, do you feel? Do you sense that? What's best for the gospel? Some pastors say, well, I, I, would, I love the ministry, I just can't stand people. <laughs> and you know my advice to that man? Resign and get, go get an honest job. What in the world? You know? Or I've heard this too, I don't really want my church to grow. More people equals more problems. You know what my words are to that guy? Please do the rest of gospel ministry a favor and get out so that honest preachers of the gospel aren't scorned and, and, and stereotyped by people like you, you know, who don't like people and who are just in it for their retirement fund. You know, just somebody to fund my, uh, my benefits package so I can have a comfortable life and do lots of hunting and fishing. Nothing wrong with hunting and fishing, okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? We need to ask ourselves what's best for the gospel, what's best for the most people in the most places. Now, let me share some thoughts about generosity and then I need to bounce on point three and perhaps we'll save it for another time. There are three things, or no, there, first of all, I wanna share a quote from, from a friend of mine, uh, Pastor Johnny Hunt. Today's Christian spends more time studying, today's average Christian spends more time studying theologically why they shouldn't give than actually developing a generous heart and letting God develop the generous heart. This generation really well defines the gospel, but this generation struggles to declare the gospel, to get the gospel going out. And especially when it comes to giving. And let me, let me share from my own heart my journey or my growth in giving. And you can put that other slide up, Larry, okay? So there came a, a point in my life where I would have been a first time giver. And it would have been when I was a kid. It would have been when I was a teenager. And I would have gotten like you know, $10 for my grandmother for my birthday. And I would have heard my Sunday school teacher say, trust God, and give him 10%. And I would have had the sense to know that my dollar of, of 10 was making like no difference to the, like without my dollar, they weren't, they were still gonna keep the doors open. You know, uh, they weren't gonna fold or close or foreclose. My dollar didn't make a big difference for the church, but like Dr. Siss says, my dollar made a big difference for me because I was learning as a child to honor my savior and to thank him and to keep the $9 he gave me and to use them however he wanted me to use them, but to give him that first. And that first time, was a little bit, you know, a feeling of, but it's my dollar, you know? And, and there was that first time, and the, many, many of you in the room may be first time givers. Maybe you're hearing me talk about this, you're like, yeah, churches always want money. Try to hear past that, because God can show himself big time to you in, if you'll trust him, if you'll prove him. There would have been a time not long after that I would have become a regular giver. And what that means is, whenever I got any kind of income, I was giving some, somehow regularly, okay? There would have been a step further, that third step, and that would have been really, really committing to tithing. And I would say that happened the first time I had any kind of job, any kind of employment. And, you know, you look at that paycheck and, and you got bills, to, I didn't have bills to pay, I was in high school, but I began automatically right off the top saying I'm gonna give God the first fruits. Proverbs 3 honor the Lord with the first fruits of your substance. 
And so tithing was a big step. And I will tell you that for the 29 years of our married life, Dana and I have never done less than a tithe. We've done more than that most years of our marriage, but we've never done less than a tithe. That was our starting point of giving. And then over the time, you begin to see God come through for you. You begin to prove him. He begins to show himself faithful because that's what he does. He says, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God, all these other things will be added unto you. And as you mature as a Christian, and as you see God come through for you, what ends up happening is your faith and trust in God grows. Your heart grows for missions and for ministry. But because your heart grows, he also grows your ability. He grows your capacity. In other words, every man according to his ability. And then you begin to get a heart that says, God, if you'll give me more, I'll give more. Now that doesn't work if you're selfish. Like, God, give me more, so you know I'll give you more, but then you're really thinking about the part you're gonna keep. But when there's a pure heart, God, enlarge me. God, give me the promotion. Give me the year-end bonus. Give me a bigger refund on my taxes. Give, Lord, bless me so I can bless. God, if you'll give more to me, I would like to give more. And New Testament giving, more than tithing. Old Testament giving is tithing. New Testament giving, more than any other part of the Bible, is really born out of grace and love and really margin, surplus, as God blesses you. In fact, I want to read a verse to you from 1 Corinthians 16. This is Paul, who we're studying. This is his instruction to the church at Corinth. He says, concerning the collection for the saints, I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. And then verse 2, and here's what I want you to see. Upon the first day of the week, that's today, let every one of you. Now, help me out, church. Who do you think that means in the Greek? Every one of you. You guys hate it when I do that, right? Yeah, the Bible's really generally easy to understand. Every one of you. And then what does he say to do? Lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. So, so Paul says, let there be, here, here's my list. This is the list I did put in, okay? Their giving was to be worshipful giving the first day of the week. It was to be systematic giving, set aside what, you know, calculate it, figure it out, the first fruits of what God's given you. It was to be purposeful. By setting it aside, they were to, chair, to, to call it almost like a sacred gift to God. Like, God, this is your part that I'm giving back to you. So it was, uh, it was systematic and purposeful. Next, it was continual. It was a weekly thing in this picture. Monthly, weekly, bi-weekly, that's not the issue, but it was regular, it was consistent. And then it was proportional. What does that mean? As God hath prospered. So simple little instruction here, and then we gotta sprint to the finish line. The simple instruction is, if you trust God, you won't regret it. If you trust God with the first fruits, he'll bless it, he'll use it, just like he did to the church at Antioch. Are you still with me? Yes. Barely, right? All right. Number three, and we'll close. Jesus grows his church through opposition. We'll see this much through the book of Acts, and so I don't need to unpack it a lot right now. But what happens in verses 6 through 12, and you can read this and, and take time to read it later this week. They, they get to Cyprus, this island, and uh, we saw it on the map a moment ago. They get to go all throughout the whole island, and they end up in Paphos, the city to the western part of the island, and they bump into a sorcerer, okay, satanic uh, resistance. He happens to be connected to the governor of the island named Sergius Paulus, who the Bible says is a prudent man, and he had called for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the gospel. As they're going to witness and preach the gospel to Sergius Paulus, this man Bar-Jesus or Elymas, this sorcerer, the Bible says in verse 8, withstood them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. So immediately, their first stop at Cyprus, before they go on to Asia Minor, their first stop is resistance. They're giving the gospel to a key political figure, a key leader on this island. This is going to become a hub of gospel ministry on this island. And Satan is there ready to stop it. There is spiritual opposition. There is demonic uh, resistance unfolding immediately. We'll see this throughout the work and the unfolding ministry of the gospel. But there's two, two big takeaways before I close. The first 
is that God, uh, demonic and satanic and spiritual resistance to gospel ministry is real, okay? When you, you try to share the gospel with people and you will see it. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten somebody right to the point where they're ready to trust Christ. The smoke alarm goes off, the phone rings, the kids wake up, the dog starts to bark, somebody pulls into the driveway, knocks on the door. All kinds of disruptions. And this is what's happening to Paul and Barnabas. This sorcerer is right there in the middle trying to break it apart. Now, Paul rebukes him. This is the second big takeaway. Spiritual resistance can be resisted. It's a smokescreen. Satan is powerless. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So here's my takeaway. Some of you are being resisted right this week, today, tomorrow. See it for what it is and call it out for what it is. Satan, you will not win. Back off. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now what I did in your outline is I put a whole bunch of passages about spiritual opposition. And I wish we could take the next 45 minutes and unfold it all. But you're hungry. So I won't do that. But I will say this, take that outline and read it this week and make a decision. Together we will be a healthy church, generous with gospel mission and ministry in spite of spiritual opposition. And that's the message. We will be a healthy church, generous and engaged in gospel mission and ministry in spite of opposition. And here's the, the final Statement of the day. Look at verse 12. Paul rebukes the man. Satanic opposition is silenced. Verse 12, then the deputy, Sergius Paulus, when he saw what was done, what's the word, church? Believe. He believed. He trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. And he was astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And so my last appeal of the day is, if you are here, and you heard me preach about the gospel a little while ago that Jesus died and resurrected and he wants to adopt you and birth you anew and come into your life and save you and forgive you. This man, Sergius Paulus, he heard that message and you know what he did? He said, I want it, I believe, I choose Jesus, I want him to save me. It is our prayer, those of us here that know Jesus as Savior, it is our prayer that you today would make the same decision. Let's have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, I pray in these moments, before we go to lunch and enjoy fellowship, that good decisions would be made on the part of unbelievers and believers. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, we have a time at Emmanuel where we close our service with a moment of response and reflection. And with our heads bowed in this private moment, I'd like to ask you, if you've never trusted Christ as Savior, would you like to? Would you like to be like Sergius Paulus in this passage who heard the gospel and chose Jesus? To choose Jesus is to basically understand I, I'm sinful and I can't save myself and religion can't save me and I can't do enough good works to save myself. I need Jesus alone. And I'm, I'm letting go of religion. I'm letting go of secularism. I'm letting go of my old worldview and I'm I am turning to Jesus Christ as God and Savior, and I'm asking him to come into my life and save me. And if that's your desire, you could make that decision right now, right where you're seated in the quietness of this moment. God says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you'd like Jesus to save you right now, why don't you pray with me from your heart, sincerely from your heart, why don't you pray with me right now? Jesus, today I understand I'm sinful, and you came to save me, and you died on the cross, the death I deserve to die, and you rose again. And Jesus, right now I invite you to come into my life and be my personal savior. Again, from your heart, friend, sincere. Jesus, today I understand I'm sinful, and I believe that you came and died for me and rose again. And I believe you want to come into my life and save me. And so please, Lord Jesus, save me right now. Be my personal Savior. Now all across the room, heads are bowed. If you just prayed that prayer, I'd just like you to take just a second and look up at me. And I may or may not catch your eyes. But if you prayed and you meant it, just look up at me. I'm holding a Bible. 
It's a really nice uh, leather-like leather Bible, and I want to give you this. I want to give you a, a copy. This is my gift, our gift to you today. On your way out, there's a table that says next steps by the doors. Just step aside by one of those tables. There's people there. Just say, hey, I prayed with Pastor Kerry. They're not going to hassle you. They're going to congratulate you. They're going to give you this Bible and a copy of a book that I wrote to help you grow as a Christian. And if you've just trusted Christ, we congratulate you. And right now, in our seats, remain seated for a moment, but I'm going to pray for those of you that are looking at me, and I celebrate with you. Let's pray for you right now. Jesus, thank you for those who made this decision. I pray, God, that they would come by and let us give them this Bible and this book. And I pray that they would begin to grow with us here at Emmanuel as a part of our family and as a part of getting the gospel to others. Thank you for their decision. Help them to begin to learn everything that it means to their future. Thank you for your saving grace. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The first thing that the believers of Jesus did after they trusted Christ was they were baptized. And so uh, we can raise the screen right now. We have some new believers that have come today to be baptized. Baptism symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And we celebrate these. They're not coming to be saved. They're coming to publicly profess that they are saved, that they belong to Jesus, and that they're not ashamed. And uh, this is Pastor Lance's first time to baptize. So let's pray that he gets it right. No, I'm kidding. The reason he's baptizing, though, is that uh, one of the, is Wesley here, Lance? Yeah, uh, one of the young men that will be baptized in a moment, Lance led to Christ, and Bernie invited him, and uh, so we're so glad for these. And I love it when the kids get baptized. So this is a moment of celebration, church, okay? Hey, first off, um, this morning we have two brothers uh, that have come to be baptized this morning and um, follow Jesus in baptism. The first is Griffin. Okay. Uh, Griffin, have you uh, accepted Christ as your Savior? Yes. Okay. Upon that profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> Next, we have Torin. Torin, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Yes. Okay. Upon that profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> Next we have uh, Suzanne Perenzino. Suzanne, have you uh, accepted Christ as your Savior? Yes. Okay. Upon that profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. I want, to, I want to pause and introduce Tom Paranzino, Suzanne's husband, is right down here. Tom, raise your hand. And he's been saved already and baptized, but he's coming uh, to join as a member as well as Suzanne today. So I need a motion and a second to receive Tom. All in favor say amen. 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 Welcome, Tom, to Emmanuel. We're so glad. Okay. Uh, next we have uh, Wesley. And uh, Wesley came back at uh, the end of July. And I think uh, he was invited by the Riendos. It seems like everyone was invited at some point in their lives by the Riendos. And um, he was at a tag sale, and uh, they invited him. And uh, he came to our Watermelon Fellowship that night, and uh, Greg and Chelsea got to talk with him. And uh, since then, God has been doing just an incredible work in his life. And uh, he actually read the book Done, and uh, after that had really kind of uh, assured his salvation and uh, accepted Christ as his Savior. And so he's excited today to, uh, to follow Jesus in baptism. Wesley, have you uh, accepted Christ as your Savior? All right, upon that profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> Next we have uh, Sam, Sam to Walter. Yep. Right. Sam, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Upon that profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the uh, likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. We 
have Jody Sandin here with us today to follow in baptism. Jody, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Okay. Upon that profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. All right. Well, I need to ask you for about th maybe four to five more minutes as we wrap up just a few items of, of, uh, of church family stuff, and then we'll let you go to lunch. Um, funny, funny side note to this, though. I said to Lance today, I said, you ready to baptize? I said, did you practice? He said, no. And he goes, actually, I've practiced hundreds and hundreds of times. And I said, when? He goes, and I remembered as soon as I said when. We would go on family vacation. He and Larry and Haley would get into the pool, and in he said, I'm a pastor's son, it's what I do on vacation. Because <laughs> as little kids, they would see me baptize in church, so inevitably, Larry would get Larry, uh, Lance would get Larry, and he'd say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, so they baptize him, and then they would do it to Haley just to annoy her. Haley, time to get baptized. <laughs> you know, they'd hold her down, you know. So, um, so he's had his lifetime to prepare for, uh, for baptism, okay. Uh, what do we need to talk about here before we close? Very quickly, um, first of all, the missions cards. And here's what I'm gonna ask the ushers to do. If you'll just stand at the doors, guys, as people dismiss. If you're ready to turn that card in, just drop it in on your way out, and you can do that anytime in the next few weeks uh, on the cards. We also, uh, here's, here's my closing announcements. You're invited to lunch. We have a Holy Land meeting right up here after service. Give me about seven or eight minutes to shake hands. And then we are doing some demolition work after lunch. Uh, we don't like the auditorium. We're going to tear it up and try. No, just kidding. We're, we're tearing up the floor in the fellowship hall and uh, tearing out an office over here to create a bookstore. And if your spirit animal is Wreck-It Ralph, and you are the kind of man or woman, frankly, that likes to take things and tear them up, you know, just beat things with a hammer. Or if you have some pent up anxiety and you need to let it out, okay, this is your happy day, all right? So after lunch, you connect with one of the pastoral staff, they'll team you up, but we're tearing up the fellowship hall and tearing up an office and you'll be really excited to see the results of your vision fund giving in, in a six week period or so, all right?